those years were totally lost in every respect. No studying, there were no books available. There was oh, certainly no newspaper available. There was a huge hole of growing up. You walked, you saw bodies right and left from you, and if you couldn't walk anymore and you were left behind, they shut you. I guess, as they say, Hashem was with us. Not only that, I say, if nobody would have survived, the world would not have known what happened to the Jewish people. We were introduced to the Names Not Numbers oral history film project and an assembly of the entire 12th grade. Every person has a name. And that is exactly what the Nazis wanted to do. They wanted to remove the identity of the Jewish people by putting numbers on their arms. And it is our responsibility to restore their identity. You are the last group of students we're going to be able to hear the personal testimonies of those who went through the Holocaust. And it will be your responsibility in the future generations to tell the stories that you heard. The National Library in Jerusalem, which is also the Hebrew University's library, they never accept any curriculum or any projects that are done in any schools. They have accepted your movie, the movie that was made at MTA last year, and also the one at Central. So it is a great credit to the project. And in fact, they've also asked that the future movies that are coming from the school will also be put into the, uh, into the library. There. We're going to be making this and presenting it to them when it's all done. So it's like, it's like you're saying, you know what, we really appreciate you and the fact that you went through this and here we are as grandchildren or as, as ancestors and, and we want to pass this on to you as a present. This movie is not about you guys, unfortunately. My movie is. But your movie isn't. Your movie's about them. So you want to make sure that the camera's on them. It's not on you guys. Um, everything that's done is about them that day. So they're the stars. When they come into school, and until the time they leave, it's all about them. These cameras that we're going to use, some of you may have cameras at home. They're very similar in size. Um, they use a similar type of tape. However, um, a couple things different about these is that they accept headphones and they accept microphones. So is this a wide shot or a close-up shot? Mr. Joseph Berger, columnist from the New York Times and former student at MTA, instructed us in interviewing techniques for an oral history. The real meat and potatoes of this program is the interviewing of the survivors. And now that you've gotten uh, about two-thirds of your academic uh, understanding of the Holocaust, you can have a better uh, expert in interviewing uh, uh, techniques. Uh, and what to do in certain situations, how to make the most of an interview. It's very important to listen. Listening is, is one of the hardest skills. You know, we can talk, but it's very hard to actually listen and listen carefully and sensitively to what someone says. It's really important to, to interview people not just about the war, but about what happened after the war. How, how they were able to reestablish themselves. After weeks of preparation, the big day finally came.
my mother was just a housewife, cooking and a lot of things for poor people. She used to bake to us their chalas and sent all over to the poor people. And they made a table in the Bismedrish and everybody knew that Purim, the Shochet, gives a big soda, which he thought that some mitzvah poor people should eat. So uh, that's what my mother did, cooked a lot for them. I was a dressmaker. They ask you always what kind of profession you have. If you had to fix the uniforms from the, from the front, what came back torn, you know. So we all had machines, and I was the first machine by the door. So always a Nazi which watched us, Landersdorfer was his name, used to came in to me and his Schneiderin, could you fix me this, could you fix me that? And I used to fix it. Then when the liquidate the Shebnya, they took us to Plashov, Krakow Plashov. And there he was already the second hand from Get. You hear it from Get? <coughs> When we came to Plashov and he saw me, he said, Was machst du denn hier? I said, Man hat mich hier geschickt, das sind mir hier. He remembered that I was sewing for him and was going a group to Schindler and he put me on the list. Throughout history, we've always been persecuted, whether, like, you know, like he said, whether it was the Spanish Inquisition or being chased out of England or France or Germany. And so, Perhaps the Holocaust was different in scale, but in terms of intention and perhaps in terms of result, it, it very much falls under the same category of being killed and prosecuted and chased. So I guess the question would be really be is do we try to understand, or another question we could raise is do we try to understand it, why it happened and the results, or is it the kind of thing where we kind of step back and say, you know, this is God acting. And I think personally we should, you know, at least, you know, I think part of what Names on Numbers does is that it, we kind of strive for an understanding of at least, least life before and what have, may have led up to it. And um, you know, if that's what we can extrapolate from the events and from the interviews, then you know, we've done at least some good. Like, in fact, theodicy, the question of how to justify God's ways to man, is probably the oldest, most perennial question that religious champions of religion have to, have to address. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? And why do good things happen to bad people? And then the question, is the Holocaust somehow unique in the history of, of mankind for its evil and for the question of where was God? Is it sui generis? Is it its own event that can't be compared? Or is it just in degree much more awful and much, much more horrible? Or is it even in kind something dramatically different? I was always believing that God will help me. I never lost faith, never. Some girls used to, oh, nish with my mouth that there's nobody there, or this, you know. Not me. Whenever it's supposed to be a selection, everybody was crying. Oh, they're going to kill us tomorrow. I said, why don't you have betuchu? Maybe they will not kill us. I always had hope and a belief. Spielberg called me 10 times to interview. I said, I can't. I get so emotional and I get palpitation. I can't and I never did it. But I couldn't refuse him, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. I'm the only one from the whole town. From the whole town. Oh, uh -huh.